Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, our first talk of the morning is Slava Fraterna. He's in China, which conveniently is exactly 12 hours from now, or behind us. I'm not sure which way, but anyway, it's evening for him. So I'll let him let him go, so then we'll go to bed after this. Thanks, Slava. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. Yeah, it's a late hour here in Shenzhen, uh, but I am extremely happy and pleased uh, to be uh, today with them. Uh, of course, I would prefer to be there in this great room and to share this moment with him. Uh, unfortunately, it did not happen, but I saw them uh, quite recently, so I hope this counts. We had a good time. Uh, I uh, I don't remember exactly, but it's definitely around 30 years ago that we met first time. It was then when he visited uh, me in, in at Queens in Kingston, Ontario. Uh, that was our first meeting, and that probably in my office uh, that uh, then got an offer, but I don't rem remember. It was a postdoc or your first job, I forgot. First job. <laughs> first job, yeah. So it happened in my office. And uh, and then of course, uh, many times uh, visiting Athens. And actually we were colleagues for one semester in Logan, Utah. That was a very memorable time. So it's a real pleasure uh, to speak at Dan's conference. And so here's my talk, uh, title of my talk, and uh, it's based on some joint work with uh, my colleague, Lucas Calisto, and my ex-PhD uh, student, Enrique Roche. Yeah, let's look at this picture. I, I don't know if Dan has it. Uh, so this is about uh, 2004 or 2002, I'm not sure. And then we can, you can see Dan here, right? And there's uh, Arturo Pianzolo, Mark Rosso, Carl Herman Eve. So we're having a good time with wine. So those 20 something years ago, so it was beautiful. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have, uh, I have nice pictures with them together, but unfortunately not here. So I left them in Brazil. That's all I could find. Okay, so let's start. So G, this little g will be a finite dimensional simply super algebra. So I will assume that it is basic classical, meaning that uh, g1 is completely reducible as a module over G0, so the odd part over even part of the superalgebra. And we have a non invariant bilinear, non degenerate uh, bilinear form. Uh, and then, so we have these types, yeah, these classical types uh, uh, SLMN and OSP, and then exceptional F3, G4, and this one parameter uh, series D. Right, so these are the algebras that uh, uh, finite dimensional ones, which I'm interested in. Uh, then, uh, so they're divided uh, depending on the structure of G1 as a G0 module, they're divided in type one and type two. And here's just a table to remind you, I'm sure you've all seen it many times. Which ones are type one, type two, and what is G0, the even part in this case? And there are two gradings, the Z grading and Z2 grading. And for type one, so the Z grading uh, looks like that. And for type two, it looks like that. So this is just the, the basics uh, on the these types of um, finite dimensional superalgebras that we will deal with. Okay, now let's take a commutative associative algebra. So everything over complex numbers. And then we can tensor G and A 
And uh, so this is uh, map super algebra or loop super algebra, sometimes it is called, uh, with a natural Lie bracket. So this is uh, one way of construct to construct uh, a family of uh, simple uh, infinite dimensional uh, Lie algebras based on a finite dimensional or super algebras based on a finite dimensional one and in a commutative associative algebra. Uh, there is a parallel theory uh, when we, instead of uh, doing a tensor product, we just take a derivation algebra of A, uh, not related to G. And that's another source of uh, simple infinite dimensional algebras. <clears throat> They're not always simple, but the, the, there is a criteria. I'm talking about derivation algebras. So uh, when it is simple, it is known. So that's a good source of infinite dimensional simple Lie algebras. And, but I'm not going to talk about derivation algebras today, just on this tensor product. The central extension uh, of the, the standard loop algebra of G, when we use uh, Laurent polynomials uh, as our algebra A, so the universal central extension is one dimensional. So this is a fine, Lie super algebra. And if we add derivations, uh, one dimensional derivations, then uh, with a natural action, uh, then we get a fine Katz Moody super algebra. Right? So I will just denote, I'm just fixing notations. G hat is a fine Katz Moody. Now, if we don't have a derivation, just universal central extension, this is AG. And this is a loop algebra corresponding to a pair G and A. So these are my main objects today. Uh, these algebras, LGA, so they have a geometric origin because they correspond to Lie super algebras of regular maps from scheme X to with coefficients in uh, G, with values in G. Uh, another uh, family of algebras of this type, uh, they're so-called creature novikov algebras. So they correspond to the case when A is the algebra of meromorphic functions on the Riemann surface with a fixed finite set of poles. Yeah, that's a very interesting class of algebras uh, that were introduced uh, years ago by creature novikov and they're all examples of this map, Lie algebras and super algebras. Uh, for my Cartan subalgebra of this uh, uh, map, Lie super algebra, uh, I fix the Cartan subalgebra just of underlying finite dimensional one. And the category of modules that I am interested in is so called Hari Chandra modules. They are weight modules with respect to Cartan subalgebra. Yeah, they have this decomposition into a sum of uh, weight subspaces. And uh, the Inharishandra module means that uh, all subspaces are finite dimensional. And, and especially I will be interested in the bounded one, ones. So these are Harishandra modules for which the multiplicities of the weights or equivalently the dimensions of weight spaces are all uniformly bounded. Uh, not necessarily one dimensional, but they are uniformly bounded. So let me recall uh, the story or the situation with a fine Katz Moody algebras. So a, a subset of the root system, so delta is a root system of a fine Katz Moody algebra. So a subset is called a quasi partition if it satisfies these two conditions, A and B. A is quite natural, so we, because you can picture immediately positive and negative roots, right? Intersection is empty and the union gives the full root system. Yeah, that's uh, positive and negative roots is an example uh, uh, of a subset that satisfies A. But B uh, is something, uh, else. So if we take uh, a subalgebra uh, generated by Cartan and 
all the roots spaces uh, and the, all the roots uh, subspaces that correspond to the roots from this subset P, let's denote it BP. Then any root of this subalgebra is already in P, which means we cannot create anything else, any additional one. So of course, if P is a closed subset, then it's automatic, then B follows. But in general, uh, we don't require P here to be a closed subset. Uh, if it is closed, then it's not quasi, it's just called the partition, then we don't need B, it's automatic. And then if we take uh, the subalgebra BP for a given quasi partition P, this way we essentially get uh, all possible Borel subalgebras. This is the most general definition of a Borel subalgebra in the affine case. And uh, uh, there exists a finite uh, number of conjugacy classes of Borel subalgebras, and they are parametrized, essentially parametrized, uh, by parabolic subalgebras of the finite dimensional G. Right? So we always have more than one orbit or one conjugacy class, but uh, finitely many. Yeah, this was first observed by Jacobson and Katz. And examples, of course, Borel subalgebra, the standard one, which corresponds to the positive root. And the other extreme case is a natural one, which corresponds to this, uh, which, uh, uh, this subset of the root system. The real roots, they are just uh, positive roots of a finite dimensional G shifted by all possible imaginary roots, is positive or negative, and uh, the semi-line of imaginary roots. It can be positive or could be negative also. So there are two extremes and there are finitely many in between choices. Sorry, I thought I missed the slide. And uh, so that we define uh, Borel subalgebras, and similarly we can define parabolic subalgebras uh, as the ones corresponding to now closed subsets of delta, uh, just satisfying uh, this condition. Yeah, and then taking corresponding root spaces and, and generating a subalgebra will give us parabolic subalgebra in the affine case. And a parabolic subalgebra always contains some Borel, and if contains standard one, then this parabolic subalgebra is called of type one, and if, if it contains a natural one, it is called type two. So there are some modifications. This phi means the natural Borel can be slightly modified uh, uh, with respect to some function phi. So I don't want to go into details here. So there's not just one natural Borel, but there is a whole series uh, of such similar types of Borels, but they are not conjugate. And uh, so these two types, uh, they differ in the, in the following sense. So if we have a parabolic subalgebra of type one, then the Levy decomposition with the Levy subalgebra L and the radical U satisfies the condition that the Levy is a finite dimensional reductively algebra. Right, that's analog of the finite dimensional case. That's what happens for finite dimensional Lie algebras. Sorry. And uh, on the other hand, for type two parabolic subalgebras, the Levy factor L is infinite dimensional. And it can be just a Heisenberg subalgebra or a sum of some Heisenberg subalgebra and affine Lie subalgebras. Right, so that's a, a more complicated, uh, way more complicated uh, case comparing to type one. And now, now given a parabolic subalgebra P, uh, one can define in the usual way uh, the induced module, so the generalized Verma module, starting from some uh, irreducible module over the Levy subalgebra L and extending trivially uh, to, the, uh, to the radical, module over the radical, and then hence to the parabolic subalgebra, a module over parabolic subalgebra. 
And then the, it has a unique simple quotient as, uh, as usually. And then there we have a old result uh, with Silke, which says that if we have a simple Harishandra module with a, of a non-zero level, meaning the, the central element C X non-trivially, then we can always find a parabolic subalgebra P of type one, not of type two, but of type one. So it's sort of a standard one and a, and a simple module over the Levy factor, module N, such that this module V is, uh, uh, is isomorphic to this irreducible quotient of the induced model. And moreover, so the Levy is uh, re reductively algebra with simple components of type A and C as follows from the finite dimensional theory of Fernando and Mathieu. Right, that's a result of Fernando in fact. Right, so in this case, which, uh, so when the central charge is not zero, so for finite dimensional algebras, uh, not super algebras, algebras, the situation is very clear for Harishandra modules. Uh, when central charge is zero, that's an old claim of uh, Dimitrov and Grancharov uh, from 2010, but it is still unpublished. Right, so presumably we have a classification also in this case. And for the loop algebra, so now here, this is for G hat, right? That's when we have a, a derivation. If we don't have a derivation, if we just have a loop algebra, that's a rather recent result of uh, Britton Lemire and Michael Lau, uh, giving a classification of uh, Harishandra models in this case. Now let me pass to super algebras, uh, a fine super algebras. So we have LG, that's a loop super algebra. Then in this case, uh, passing from LG to AG is easy because uh, if we're interested in bounded module, then the, which is our case, the central charge must be zero. And then, so we have a functor from LG modules to G hat modules, which works in the following way. So if we start with some LG weight module and we can tensor it with Laurent polynomials and we define the structure of G hat modules in this way, right? The central charge is zero and the, the degree derivation follows the degree of uh, the T, the power of T. And so if, if you have a bounded Harishandra module to start with, then LV also will be a bounded Harishandra module. So given us this functor. Okay, so this is just preliminary, uh, preliminaries uh, which are known. And now I consider the general case of a map super algebra. So suppose we have a triangle decomposition of an underlying finite dimensional algebra. Uh, so we're splitting it in, into positive part, zero part, and negative part uh, using some functions, function L with integer values on a root lattice. So the value zero corresponds to zero part and respectively, positive values correspond to positive part, negative to negative. So this gives us a triangle decomposition. And then based on this triangle decomposition, we get a triangle decomposition of a map, a least super algebra, just in a natural way. Uh, so if the zero part is not the whole G, then we say that it is proper. And now let's construct an induced module. Since we have a triangle decomposition, so we can play uh, the usual game. Uh, if we take a module over the zero part, extend trivially to positive part, then we have a module over sort of parabolic subalgebra of this capital G, and then we can induce it. And if the starting module is irreducible, then uh, we have a unique 
maximal submodule and a unique irreducible quotient. And our first result uh, says that for any uh, simple finite means uh, Harishandra module, weight Harishandra module over our Mapley super, super algebra, there exists a triangle decomposition of the kind uh, that I described that this corresponds to the roots of positive uh, part of G, zero part of G, and negative part of G. Such that the elements of, of the module annihilated by G plus part, so G plus invariance, is a simple uh, bounded G. This is G zero module. And our module is isomorphic to this uh, reducible uh, quotient of the induced module. So it says that every module, it's sort of uh, analog of the, that theorem from 2001, the non-zero charge, right? but for the very specific parabolic subalgebras. Okay, so we're saying that, uh, of course, this triangle decomposition can be trivial, right? So zero part can be can coincide with everything. But at least there is a, a parabolic induction. Okay, now suppose we have uh, an irreducible module. So if the zero part is not everything, so it's proper, then we will say that mo module is parabolic induced in this case. And if it is not, if it, I mean, if it is not parabolic induced, meaning the G zero is the whole G, which means the theorem does not provide any information, we just say that the module is cuspidal. Then the first natural question is when our Lie super algebra admits cuspidal modules. When it happens, we call it cuspidal superalgebra, cuspidal Lie superalgebra. And uh, the observation is that it is cuspidal if and only if the little g is a cuspidal superalgebra, which means that this, the map Lie superalgebra admits cuspidal modules, modules which are not parabolically induced, if and only if the finite dimension, underlying finite dimensional one does. But for finite dimensional one, this question has been studied before. And actually they were classified. So there were two parallel classification, one obtained by Dimitrov, Grancharov, and Matthew, Matthew uh, in 2004. And then uh, we had a completely different from different point of view with Rao in 2009. And they are the following. So OSP12, OSP12 extended by SL2, and OSP N to N with such restriction for N. So just, just finitely many of them. And the series D. So these are super algebras or reductively algebra with simple components a and C, right? Only for such finite dimensional cuspidal superalgebras, there exist uh, cuspidal modules. And uh, respectively, if we tensor with A, only for these tensor products, there, there, there exist cuspidal modules. So it immediately reduces the whole story to the study of cuspidal modules just for these ones. And for finite dimensional one, the answer is no, right? So it is due to Grancharov and Grancharov and Serganova. And, and recently, uh, Grancharov, Serganova, and Pinkov actually extended this to direct limits of superalgebras. So the, in the finite dimensional case, uh, everything is well known now. Okay, and so here is the main result. So suppose we have a, a simple uh, Harishandra module. Uh, then 
So I'm just uh, summarizing uh, what I said before. Uh, so then we know that this module is uh, induced from something, but possibly trivially induced. Okay. And, and as a result, so it's either cuspidal, and in this case bounded, multiplicities are bounded, or it is uh, parabolically parabolic induced from a simple cuspidal bound module over bounded module over certain uh, sub super algebra of G. All right, so this is the finer uh, statement uh, comparing to the first one. So either we need cuspidal modules which are bounded by definition, or uh, uh, modules induced from cuspidal bounded modules. So that's all we need to know now, uh, simple bounded modules. And so this is just what we already saw. Then uh, the uh, cuspidal modules exist for capital G, and only if they exist for the little g. And in this case, the um, even part must be semi-simple. So the analog of this theorem uh, was shown for uh, modules or for a fine Kasmodi algebras with non-zero central charge back in those paper, in that paper with Rao. Uh, finite dimensional uh, modules for over map super, uh, uh, super algebras, they were described by Alistair Savage in 2014 and uh, then extended uh, by Callisto and Macedo in 2019. So the finite dimensional one are, are well known. We're interested in infinite dimensional with bounded multiplicities. Then one remark, which was, uh, this was noticed by Alistair, that not every parabolic induced module is a Harishandra module, right? That's different from uh, finite. If you, if you induce from Harishandra module, you don't get Harishandra module necessarily. That's very different from finite dimensional situation. And in, in his example, so he takes the basic classical Lee super algebra G, and as A, we take uh, just polynomials in T. Then uh, the composition uh, will be in positive and negative roots. And as a G0 part, we take, uh, yeah, so this is just the composition of the root system in positive and negative roots. As a G0 part, we take Cartan tensor with A. And then we consider, uh, we fixed some element of the Cartan subalgebra and we consider uh, this function lambda. There is a field missing here. Uh, such that the value of lambda is this rational number. And then uh, it was shown that if we start with a G0, one dimensional G01, so trivial module essentially, then uh, corresponding highest weight module is not a Harishandra module. Now, it is some weird example which shows that in this general setup with MAP superalgebras, uh, strange thing might happen. Okay, so every module over the Levy uh, uh, sub super algebra of a parabolic sub algebra or a fixed parabolic sub algebra is just a tensor product of simple modules over simple components of this uh, Levy super algebra. And therefore, we need just uh, everything is reduced to classification of bounded cuspidal modules associated to cuspidal, uh, Lee super, uh, cuspidal basic simple Lee super algebras, as we mentioned above, just the simple, simple ones. And I already mentioned that in the case of a Lie algebra, uh, the answer is known uh, due to Britton, Lemire, and Lau. And then, so we can remove the Lie algebra cases, and then we just left 
with these uh, types of super algebras. And uh, the final uh, result is uh, that, uh, in particular, it's for any super algebra with G0 semi simple, that any simple cuspidal bounded module over this uh, map Lee super algebra is an evaluation module. Okay, so let me remind what evaluation module is. So uh, we choose a number of pairwise distinct maximal ideals of our commutative algebra A. And then the evaluation map uh, goes from G to the uh, R's power of finite dimensional G, just through uh, factoring by maximal, these maximal ideals, right? So it's just a natural map that goes from our Mapley superalgebra to this R's power of finite dimensional one. Now, if we take uh, our uh, G modules, right, with uh, corresponding row, row representation, a B module, then we have a map from G to GR, and then a representation on this tensor product, which makes uh, this tensor product of the ice a module over our G, which is called evaluation module. And then to prove the theorem, so the theorem here, that every cuspidal bounded module is actually like that of this type. So we start with any such module, then it's annihilator can be presented as an intersection of a, some distinct maximal ideals of A. And then, then this quotient will be isomorphic to the R's power of G. And in particular, B is a simple of this GR module. And in fact, B is isomorphic to the tensor product of V1 v and VR. Uh, for some uh, simple Harishandra modules we want, we are, and only one of them, uh, not, not only one, at most one of them can have, uh, can be infinite dimension. Yeah, if we have one infinite, one infinite dimension, all others must be finite dimension. And then we have uh, representation of G in here. Right? That's the idea uh, of the proof of this statement. But again, so the theorem is that every simple cuspidal bounded module over Mapley superalgebra is a relation model. Now, suppose we have some uh, simple Harishandra uh, modules for a finite dimensional G and uh, same number of maximal, distinct ma maximal ideals of A. Then uh, this tensor product, uh, the evaluation, this G module will be simple, um, will be cuspidal bounded module if and only if one, uh, uh, exactly one of these uh, modules VIs will be infinite dimensional. And in this case, this VI must be a cuspidal bounded G model. All others are finite dimension. And moreover, the final piece of the puzzle is if uh, this module is cuspidal bounded, then it is automatically simple. And this completes uh, classification uh, of all uh, cuspidal bounded modules for Mapley superalgebra. And now any other uh, Harishandra module is uh, parabolic induced from such modules. Or one of the uh, sub superalgebras. Right, so that uh, completes the classification. And then then I want to make uh, some remarks uh, again about affine case. So there's an alternative approach using the cuts functor. 
So suppose that G is of type one. And then G has this uh, grading where G zero is a reductively algebra with one dimensional center and plus minus one say irreducible G zero modules. And bin, bin of type one, we have this zero product of uh, odd parts. So in this case, uh, so we can approach uh, classification using uh, this concept of a cuts module, just using, uh, uh, considering induced module from uh, arbitrary uh, module over the even part of our affine cuts Moody algebra. And just imagine, take S to be, uh, say, simple module over G0, G1 uh, declared to act trivially and induced up. So this module uh, will have a unique uh, simple quotient you know, and which gives us a functor from uh, G0 modules to G hat modules. Well, I define it for simple ones, that's what we're interested. So from a simple G0 hat module, we get a simple G hat module. And then if, uh, so suppose we have a simple bounded G hat module M, then we look at the this sub, sub, uh, subspace of elements annihilated by the odd part, which is a non-trivial, so this is a G, G1 invariance, G1 hat invariance. And this will be a simple bounded G0 module. Yeah? From the simplicity and boundness of M, we get simplicity and boundness of this module. And M will be isomorphic to, uh, to, the, to the cuts module. Uh, I guess the quotient of the cuts model. Right, and then now we can uh, put this into a final result. So that for basic classical Lie superalgebras of type one, so the cuts induction functors gives bijection between the isomorphism classes of simple bounded Harish-Chandra modules for a fine cuts Moody algebras and uh, simple bounded uh, Harishandra modules uh, for the even part. Yeah, so the G hat is a super algebra for the simple part, for the even part. So historically, uh, in, in this, uh, for the algebra case, we used it with Silke in 2001. And recently, Chen and Mazarchuk um, developed a general, a similar general approach for arbitrary superalgebras uh, with uh, this property that follows from, in our case, uh, when G is of type one. But they develop a general approach which allows to reduce the study of um, modules over superalgebras to the modules over the even part. And one more remark. So if the central charge is not zero, then a classification of simple bounded modules over affine Katsumudi algebras reduces to the classification of bounded modules uh, induced from cuspidal. Right, as we already have seen, uh, just rephrasing what I already mentioned before, for types A and C algebras. Right, so these are just type A and C, and uh, in these cases, the answer is known due to uh, theorem of Olivier Mathieu, uh, where classification of all cuspidal modules was obtained, and hence we have in this case also a complete classification. And perhaps uh, I forgot to mention that in the finite dimensional case for, for finite dimensional 
superalgebra G. Uh, cuspidal models uh, were classified by uh, Goncharov and Goncharov Serganova, and the technique used was similar to the technique of uh, Meteor in the algebra case using the uh, twisted localization punter and starting from highest weight modules and then applying this punter to obtain finally uh, cuspidal modules. So in the panel dimensional case, the, the theory is parallel. Right, so, so let's uh, round it up. So once again, so for all uh, map Lee super algebras of type G, where G is a finite dimensional, nice finite dimensional Lee super algebra, tensoring with a commutative associative algebra, we obtain a classification of all uh, simple Harishandra modules, all of them are parabolic induced. So either they are cuspidal bounded or they are parabolic induced from cuspidal uh, modules over some Levy uh, subsuperalgebras. These Levy subsuperalgebras are called cuspidal. They are very specific ones. There are finitely many of them. Uh, in the finite dimensional story, classification is known, but in our case, uh, the module is. Uh, uh, so everything is reduced, uh, therefore, to the classification of cuspidal modules, and uh, they are all evaluation modules. So then that's complete story. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Slava. Uh, let's see if we have questions from the audience. And I have a microphone, so I'm gonna have to run around a little bit, Slava, to be patient. I think um, I just wanted to ask, um, I, I just wanted to ask you about the class because uh, the body dimensional case, if you do induction, you get something rather complicated, not always a reducible module. Maybe I'm missing this quickly or what what is happening. Uh so I could not hear. I I heard cuts module. So yeah. what, what speak up louder. Ah, okay. So in, in classical case, cut module might be very of a very difficult structure. Are you saying that in, in some situations, in this situation, somehow you said it's at least as I understood it, is it irreducible? Or no, 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 Ah, okay. Other questions? So I have a question for you, Slava. So you were doing the uh, classical case. Can you say anything what happens if you were to do types Q or P? Well, uh, you you mean cons considering maps superalgebras for types P and Q? Exactly. Yeah, so we have not, uh, no, certainly many things can be done, but we have not looked uh, at these cases. So perhaps Vera can say more about this. I didn't look at that one. Ah, no, so we consider certain uh, applying super algebra uh, which is related to the type Q, and there was an interesting phenomenon uh, that uh, the model generically is reducible. 
But that was a very specific case. That's all I know. Yes. <clears throat> so for type, uh, yeah, for Q, F fine. Uh, yeah, we considered also there are some results, but not in the full generality, like for MAP, from Lee super algebras. No, this has not been done. Other questions? All right, let's thank Slava again.